As we continue reading there, beloved, the Bible says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when they saw, I'm sorry, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. We realize that the chief priests and elders had given the Judas Iscariot thirty pieces of silver to betray Christ. And there was a period of time, no doubt, that Judas was looking forward to what he would be able to do with that money, how he would spend those 30 pieces of silver. Well, now suddenly, for whatever reason, Judas realizes the grave mistake that he has made. And lo and behold, he tries to return that silver. As the Bible goes on to say, the Judas saying there is saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. Judas realized the mistake that he's made. He realized, beloved, that he, has, uh, that he has betrayed Christ, that he's taken money to be able to do so. After he gets convicted, he tries to return that money, and he realizes that it cannot be done. The Bible says, And he cast down the piece of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for them to be put into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. Now, beloved, as we read the narrative before us, do not lose sight of the fact, here the chief priests, they're saying, uh, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. In other words, they're concerned about the law, but consider what it is that they're about to do to the Lord Jesus Christ, an innocent man. They're there making plans and scheming to nail the Lord of glory to the cross of Calvary, and yet they're concerned about the legalities of taking this 30 pieces of silver and putting them back into the treasury. And they took counsel, and once again a very peculiar saying, and they took counsel. In other words, here's a group of them. There has to be more than one if they're taking counsel. No doubt there was somewhat of a, a large group of them, but the Bible says, and they took counsel. They discussed it between themselves, realizing what they were doing and the fact that it was wrong, and yet they proceeded on, and they took counsel and brought with and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that, I'm sorry, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, that would be Jeremiah, of course, saying, and they took the 30 piece of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. In verse number 11, the Bible says, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest, thou sayest, Christ there, beloved, the incarnate Word of God, He who had created the heavens and the earth with the power of just His mouth, the verbal, verbal creation. And lo and behold, the Bible tells in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, beloved, the eternal Word of God. And as they had asked them that question, and Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Two words there was the response of Christ. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Christ did not try to defend himself, nor did he try to thwart their plans there. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him, To never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Beloved, realizing that death was at hand, we must also consider the fact that though Christ realized that death was at hand, Christ in no way was trying to deliver himself from this death. He knew that the, the plans and inventions of wicked men was about to be carried out against him, but yet he also realizes as he was there resting in the hand of his father, beloved, he realized that that which was about to be carried out had been planned before the creation of the world. The Bible says in verse 15, Now at the feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? As the Bible makes mention that Barabbas was a notable prisoner, he would be the type of prisoner such as someone... Uh, considered as Charles Manson, for those of you who would remember him in our day. In other words, Charles Manson was an extremely 
wicked man guilty of egregious crimes. And lo and behold, this was the type of man that Barabbas was. Not saying that he carried out the same crimes, but the point was news of the wickedness of Barabbas had traveled around the countryside. Thus, thus the Bible refers to him as a notable prisoner. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. That would once again be the high priest there. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? The wife, beloved, of this man refers to Christ as a just man. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Did you ever meditate on that particular passage of scripture there that the wife of this man beloved the governor's wife lo and behold she says for i have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him it is not revealed to us in the word of god but it is an interesting thing to meditate upon what could it have been what kind of dreams did she have about christ and how was it that the spirit had dealt with her there in verse 20, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And Pilate saw that he could not, I'm sorry, and Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Pilate realized, beloved, based on what his wife had said. Now, I'm not saying Pilate was a saved man, but Pilate realized that that which was about to be carried out, that it was somewhat of a wicked invention come up with, with the scribes, the Pharisees, and the high, high priest. And it was because they, they had envied the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry. The Bible then says there, in verse number 25, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. There are times, beloved, that I think about all of the wickedness that has been uh, turned against the Jewish nation. There were times when I would watch a movie about the Holocaust. I was talking with someone years ago and watched a movie about the Holocaust. And lo and behold, they said, why do you think that was, that all of those things had befallen the Jews, God's chosen people? And this particular verse, to be honest with you, is what come to my mind. That back there all those years ago, the people there... The scribes, the Pharisees, the spokesmen for the Jewish nation at that time, then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Beloved, it's a terrible thing when things like that come back upon your children, when they had brought them upon their children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, before we move on, May I encourage you by God's grace, first of all, think about someone that you are close to in your life that you love. Think about that. Now that you think about someone in your life that you love, imagine if they were set to be executed by lethal injection later this evening in a prison. How would you be feeling about that? In other words, would, you're, would you not be distraught, discouraged, somewhat depressed, and yet the Bible says that they delivered him to be crucified. And Christ realizing what was, that which was about to be carried out against him. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now once again, beloved, Think with me about this. If this was someone that you love, if this were your child, your relative, someone, someone that you love greatly, could you imagine them being taken in and made fun of to be belittled there in front of that whole group of people? And those soldiers were there belittling him and making fun of him. And as they're there saying, Hail, King of the Jews, as much as they possibly could, beloved, to belittle our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him in, I'm sorry, smote him on the head. Beloved, how would you feel if it was your wife or your daughter and someone were to spit on them in your presence? How would it make you feel? 
Now, once again, this is exactly what they were doing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to be crucified. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they can build to bear the cross. There is a religion, beloved, we will not mention that religion. I do not want to give them grounds or traction or anything else. But there's one religion in particular that you all would know if I were to mention it. And they claim that the Lord Jesus Christ fell beneath the cross. They said that Christ was walking, that he fell beneath the cross. Well, beloved, may I remind you, the Bible never one time says that our Lord and Savior stumbled nor fell beneath the cross. But rather simply... And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear the cross. And when they were come unto the place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Well, again, it is a custom during Old Testament times, during ancient times, that before a person would go to the cross, the, the vinegar would be somewhat fermented, and lo and behold, that was served to soothe the pain just a little bit. Well, as the scripture says, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his raiments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. The heartlessness of those who were involved in this crucifixion as it was being carried out. For most people, beloved, if you're any kind of a hunter at all, if you ever injure or wound an animal, it is a very gut-wrenching thing to sit there and watch that animal struggle for its life. Thus, oftentimes we'll say, put them out of their misery. When they give someone lethal injections, so on and so forth, they give them medication to be able to deal with that. But yet these particular people here, they were so bloodthirsty. And as the Bible says that after they had parted his garments and all of those things, the Bible says in sitting down, they watched him there. What do you suppose was going through their mind as they watched him suffer? After he had been beaten, after he'd been spit upon, and lo and behold, they had then nailed him to a cross. And once again, beloved, do not lose sight of the fact Oftentimes, many of us, if we get a splinter on our hand, we will squirm. We'll take and say, man, I got a splinter in my hand. I got to get it out. It's painful. Beloved, our Lord and Savior, they took spikes and they drove through his hands, his wrist, and his feet as they nailed him there to the cross of Calvary. A big hammer and spikes, and they nailed our Lord and Savior down there to that cross. It goes on to say in verse 37, and set up over his head his accusation written, this is the king of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him on the right hand and on the other left, and another on the left, I'm sorry, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Beloved, make no mistake about it. The Lord Jesus Christ could have come down from that cross. He could have been a perfectly healed man as he would have come down from that cross without an injury whatsoever on him. Had he so desired, he could have come down from that cross. But as the song says, and as many people have said before, his love was that which held him there to the cross, his love for the people for whom he was suffering. It says there, he trusted in God. Once again, them making fun of our Lord and Savior. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in, their, in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour... There was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. This would have had to have been somewhat of a supernatural event with regards to the darkness on the land. In other words, if someone were to say, well, it gets dark every evening about that, then there would not have been anything notable about the darkness which had settled in upon the land. But as the Bible says there, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. We do not fully understand what that darkness is all about. I've heard some people take and say that the Father could not stand to look upon the Son, therefore he let darkness envelop him there upon the cross. 
I realize that, that it may be true and it may make for good preaching, but I also believe that God, our Heavenly Father, for the darkness and the light are alike unto Him. The darkness doesn't conceal anything from our Heavenly Father. But as it says there now, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. We've been having a lot of the smoke blow down here from the Canadian wildfires, and I did not know about you folks, but sometimes just the atmosphere in the air, it's somewhat of a peculiar thing to go out and you'll realize it's not rain clouds, it's just a darkness that's over the land. Obviously not like this darkness, but in other words, beloved, we realize that there was something supernatural taking place there. And yet seemingly for those who were standing around watching, it made no impact on their lives whatsoever. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It is a great mystery here within the Godhead. One of the greatest, greatest mysteries that we can ever grapple with our finite minds. What I mean by that, beloved, is that there has always been perfect unity within the Godhead. You may have someone here upon this earth that you get along with very well. You may even have a friend or hopefully a spouse or a child, a close friend that you've never, ever, ever had a disagreement or never an argument with one time. And yet, beloved, you may take and feel like, well, we're at one. I and my friend, I and my spouse, we're at one. We never have an argument. We never have a disagreement. But, beloved, the relationship between the Father and the Son throughout all eternity was one such that we would struggle to wrap our minds around. Never one time had they ever had a harsh word or a harsh stop between them. But as Christ Jesus hung there upon the cross of Calvary, and he had cried out there, My, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. And when Jesus had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. The lifeless body of Christ hung there up on the cross of Calvary. After all of the torturing, after all of the pain, after all of the ridicule, there is the lifeless body of Christ Jesus hanging there upon the cross of Calvary. He who is the fountain of life, he who can give life, beloved, he who raised Lazarus from the dead, there is his lifeless body hanging there upon the cross. But now notice in verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent once again, beloved, is an account here given before us that it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. There was an earthquake that had taken place, the rocks rent, the Bible says, and the significance of the veil being rent from top to bottom. In the temple, the temple would have still been in operation at this time. There were still sacrifices and offerings being offered up. There was a holy place during that time. Well, you see, beloved, that veil was a place where a separation had taken place where they were not able to enter into the holiest of all except for once a year. And that had to be one man being the high priest to offer a sacrifice. Well, when the veil of the temple was rent, beloved, that means that we are able to enter into the holy of holies, not because of what we do, but because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, beloved, he has overcome death through his death there. And it goes on to say, And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept, arose. Once again, this is somewhat of a thing that many commentators and many of my personal friends who are pastors, there's much, dis, dis, er, there's much uh, difference of opinion with regards to those folks. And the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Some people say that they had come out of what we call paradise. Uh, there are different theories with regards to that passage there. And came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Once again, beloved, it is beyond my ability personally to be able to explain satisfactorily what exactly took place there. But I will tell you this, if the word of God declares that this is what happened, then that's what happened. And we can take it to the bank. The Bible says, now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Imagine, beloved, that all of the ridicule and all of the torture that they had put the Lord Jesus Christ through, lo and behold, now, finally, they say, truly, 
this was the Son of God. Now, I want you to see this because it's an important passage. With their statement there, truly this was the Son of God. In other words, in their mind, maybe saved brothers and sisters, don't that mean that they're saved? They're now acknowledging that this uh, was the Son of God. If you notice, beloved, it seems as though they're making that statement in the past tense. In other words, they're not saying this is the Son of God, but this was the Son of God. In other words, they realize somewhat the error of their ways, and yet at least for that point in time, it was too late to save Christ from what they had done to him. Beloved, be careful with regards to wasting opportunities of our time. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, and, and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's children. And when the even was come, there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation of the chief priest and Pharisees came together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember... That while, I'm sorry, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error be worse than the first. What does that tell us then from the scriptures? In other words, they're making reference here to two errors so that the last error be worse than the first. In other words, there's some of these men that are saying, we made a mistake in crucifying him. He really was the Son of God. Man, who would have thought it? We have made that mistake. But as per their own words, they say so that the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, ye have a watch, go your way and make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. The men that would have been given from, the, uh, from Pilate, beloved, they would have been similar to the character of men of some of our special forces today. In other words, Pilate would not have got a bunch of drunken soldiers and said, hey, go keep an eye on that, because Pilate realized, beloved, his involvement in the whole thing. He would have sent the best soldiers that he had to keep a watch on that sepulcher. And we also realize that, as he says there, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In the end of the Sabbath day, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Once again, in our minds, beloved, it's hard for us to be able to grasp that. It's hard for us to be able to visualize an, a, an angel sitting on the stone. And the Bible says his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. In other words, beloved, this one angel, angel put the fear of the Lord into the hearts of these keepers there. And the angel, and for fear him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, beloved, think with me about what is taking place here. These two ladies here are going to visit the grave. As they go there to visit the sepulcher where Christ had been placed, you see, lo and behold, there was an angel there. And this angel has a message for these two ladies, the two Marys, saying, He's not here. He's risen from the dead. Imagine, beloved, if that were you. Imagine if you were the first one there to the sepulcher and you met up with an angel and they're there saying, he's risen from the dead. Imagine, beloved, because these were not superhuman beings, but they were people just like you and I are. In other words, these two Marys, they would have been humans much like you and I are. And lo and behold, this is what they had encountered there. 
And lo and behold, beloved, they were in deep grief. But then the angel had said, He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. This is obviously what many churches will celebrate on Easter, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, folks, something. Sometimes people will take and say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a major tenet in the Christian religion. You ever heard that? People say, well, the resurrection, that's something that we really hold to. That's a part of our faith. That's really part of what we believe in. Beloved, when we understand the resurrection right, we realize that the resurrection is just not part of what we believe in. It is the very grounds for all of our faith. In other words, apart from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have no business in being here today because we realize he said he would raise from the dead and he failed to do so, beloved. We can't trust any of his other promise that that was the case. But the tenet of the Christian faith, beloved, it is based upon and built upon the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus we sing the song, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And lo and behold, beloved, we worship a resurrected Christ. He has overcome death through his resurrection. And yet after the Bible says that, the angel tells them there and go quickly after they receive news that he's been raised from the dead and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and behold he goeth before you into Galilee there shall you see him lo I have told you and they departed quickly from the sepulcher, sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word and as they went to tell his disciples behold Jesus met them saying all hail all Hail. This one that they had seen dead there upon the cross of Calvary three days ago, he is there now speaking to them. And he's raised from the dead. All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go unto Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now, I want you to notice here, beloved, look on down to verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee. That's exactly what Christ has told them to do. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Beloved, there's a glorious truth which the Holy Spirit of God has divinely inspired in his word here. And I know some of you have heard me make mention of it on numerous occasions. Maybe some of you have forgotten. But as Christ met with the members of the very first church, lo and behold, as he tells them there, then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, how many's there? Eleven plus Christ. And when they saw him, they worshiped him but some doubted. Beloved, may I encourage you that within the Christian faith that there is certainly room for doubt. Now once again, I'm not saying that we should live our lives in doubt. That would be a miserable existence of a Christian life. But what I'm saying this evening is this, that out of the 11 disciples, the Bible says that some doubted. That tells me the usage of the word some, it would imply to me that there's more than one. There's at least two possibly more. I, I wouldn't go more than two. I can't say more than two emphatically based upon what's revealed in the Word of God. But the usage of the word some there, beloved, it does imply that there's more than one. And we also know that all of the apostles, beloved, all of these people, they're all saved, but yet there's some of them doubted. The reason that I want to bring this up this evening is this, because uh, actually within the circle of our faith, there was actually a movement years ago, and this movement promoted the idea that if you ever doubt, then you are damned. And that's really, that's the way that they coined that expression. If you doubt, you're damned. If you doubt, you're damned. And lo and behold, there was a pastor, uh, an erring pastor, I believe, who got up and he preached his whole church. If you've ever one time doubted your relationship with Christ, then you're damned. You're still on your way to hell. If you're ever truly saved, you'll never, ever doubt. Well, I beg to differ because according to the Word of God and among these apostles that we know were members of the first church, they were, beloved, chosen by Christ. Well, the Bible says, And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, before we move on to finish this, let me just say this. Can you imagine the roller coaster of emotions which these people have been through over the last few days? 
their Lord and Savior. Lo and behold, he's been taken from them. He's been crucified. He's been beaten severely. And lo and behold, he was nailed to the cross. And then a handful of them at least seen him die with their own eyes. Not only that, beloved, but it is not as though they seen him die and then five minutes he came to, but for three days he was there in the grave. But after that three days, he arose again from the dead. And as the Bible says there, Christ speaking to them, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Beloved, did Christ leave his church with a message to tell the nations? He absolutely did, beloved. A glorious message of how he died, how he laid there in the tomb, and after three days that he had arisen again from the dead. Now look back with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter number 26. Now all of these things have taken place. And lo and behold, beloved, there in Matthew chapter number 26 and verse number 17, the Bible says, now the, first, now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go unto the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth, as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. In verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. A funny saying to mention there to the disciples. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my body of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Beloved, this is the institution of the Lord's Supper. And as we have read numerous times there in 1 Corinthians about how that the scripture said there on a few different occasions, this do ye in remembrance of me. Beloved, after Christ had instituted the Lord's Supper, it wasn't just the fact that Christ had multiplied the loaves and fishes. It wasn't just the fact that Christ had raised people from the dead. It wasn't just the fact that Christ had changed the lives of the apostles. But even for us still today, if we are to remember what Christ had done, in other words, Christ was pointing future to them, telling them, this is my body, this is broken for you in remembrance of me. And as he tells them, this do in remembrance of me, the whole narrative, beloved, which we have read this evening with regards to the betrayal of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the death of Christ, as well as the resurrection of Christ, as well as his commissioning to his church, beloved, these are the things that we must keep in mind while we partake of the Lord's Supper this evening. In short, beloved, we must never forget the price which has been paid in order to redeem us from our sins. Because as soon as we forget that price which has been paid to redeem us from our sins, beloved, we will begin to grow distant and indifferent toward the Lord. Thus he gives to us his supper to be able to make sure that we keep it in remembrance.